in tympanometry what we do is we give some amount of sound energy in the air and see how much sound is going inside that is admitted and how much is reflected back it is not possible to measure what sound is admitted inside but we can measure what sound is reflected back so if we know you know how much sound is reflected back we if we subtract from the total energy supplied we indirectly get the measure of how much sound is admitted inside that way uh, you know we can know the amount of uh, energy that is admitted and reflected back by changing the pressure in the air canal the pressure is altered from 200 decapascal to negative 400 decapascal and that changes the compliance of the tympanic membrane so what happens the compliance of the tympanic membrane that is where the tympanic uh, membrane uh, you know the admittance of the sound is maximum inside is when the pressure inside the middle ear and in the air canal is same that is at the atmospheric pressure or uh, zero decapascal when the pressure uh, in the middle ear either is positive or negative then what happens is that the tympanic membrane becomes less compliant meaning to say the less sound is transmitted in and most of the sound is uh, reflected back so maximum sound transmission through the middle ear system occurs when the pressure in the air canal is same as in the middle ear space that's when we, we talk about the compliance of the tympanic membrane in normal middle ear system typically it occurs at the atmospheric pressure that is 760 millimeter of mercury So in tympanometry, what we do is we change the uh, pressure in the x-axis from uh, minus 200 to plus 200 decapascal and we try to get the compliance of the tympanic membrane in the y-axis. So this is the normal tympanogram. So at 0 decapascal or normal atmospheric pressure that is 76 millimeter mercury, what happens that um, the peak occurs? that is type A at 0 decapascal. So this is the normal. In pathologies, the shape of the, tymp the, shape of the tympanogram changes. For example, you get the height uh, of the tympanogram reduces as AS in uh, where the compound is less, such as, uh, for example, uh, tympanosclerosis. And you get the curve towards the negative side when that is type C when there is eustachian tube dysfunction. If there is highly compliant tympan tympanogram that is type D, this is, typically occurs in ossicular discontinuity. So what happens that you know the or the very thin tympanic membrane. So what happens is that it becomes highly compliant and you get a flat type of tympanogram when there is middle ear effusion or thick glue inside and the mobility of TM is restricted. Thus with the various shapes of this tympanogram type A, AS, type C, type D, type AD, type B we can know the different types of diseases. The presence of middle ear disorder alters the tympanogram and is predictable of the certain middle ear pathology. So uh, with the various type of tympan uh, tympanogram we are able to predict the type of pathology such as type A is normal, AS is less compliant middle ear system, AD is highly compliant uh, as in ossicular discontinuity. B is uh, when there is fluid in the middle ear or perforation, also you get type B. Type C where there is stress in tube dysfunction. So less energy is flowing through the middle ear system when it is stiff, such as in autosclerosis. Or uh, it is increased when more energy is flowing, 
such as in scarring or ossicular discontinuity. Middle ear volume uh, is uh, air canal volume. It's important to know the air canal volume in children and in adults. Adults is 0.9 to 2 centimeter cube. It can also help us to predict whether the uh, the grommet is functioning or not, where it should be 5.5 millimeter cube. Acoustic reflex, the action of the tensor tympani and the stapedus. Uh, what happens there when this muscle acts? Uh, the the com compliance or the stiffness of the tympanic membrane changes. So this change in compliance or the stiffness in the tympanic membrane is recorded. So that happens when you give a sound threshold around 85 dB above the hearing sensation level. So what happens that uh, the acoustic reflux is elicited, that stiffens the tympanic membrane and that changes the compliance of the tympanic membrane which can be measured. So, we see a significant change in the compliance. So, change in compliance is nothing but change in the admittance of the energy or, or how much energy is reflected back. So, uh, a significant change is more than 0 0.2 ml. So, when there is a significant change in the compliance of the tympanic membrane, this is picked up by the probe and it is recorded and this is known as the acoustic reflex. So the acoustic reflex threshold is the lowest intensity that results in the acoustic reflex. So uh, once you do the normal tympanometry, then in the same setting, we can proceed with the measurement of the acoustic reflex, whereby you give a high sound uh, around 85 dB above the hearing threshold level. And this sound goes and results in uh, acoustic reflex whereby the stipidus muscle is contracted and this stiffens the tympanic membrane which is recorded. Acoustic reflex may be normally absent in 5% of the population but uh, it can be useful in, in uh, children or uh, malingering patients where you can see if there is a normal stipidus reflex or not. So what do you do in a uh, stapedial reflex? Basically, you the setting is same as in tympanometer and then you uh, give additional sound stimulus in one ear and by way of the stapedial reflex arc, the impulse goes to the cochlea, to the uh, uh, cochlear nerve and then to the superior olivary complex and then from the superior olivary complex to the facial nerve and then that contracts the stapedial uh, muscle. So this reflection is recorded. So how is it recorded? It is by the change in the compliance. So compliance, it will become stiff. So it becomes less compliant. That's why you get a negative deflection in the tympanogram. So this is the acoustic reflex. The sound impulse uh, at the level of superior olivary complex, it can also go to the opposite superior olivary complex and then stimulate the other side facial nerve resulting in contraction of the other side stapedial muscle and you get a contralateral, uh, ref a contra a contralateral acoustic reflex. Here we say, you know, right-sided. So the stimulus is on the right side. We say right-sided ipsilateral and left-sided contralateral. So the side is determined by where you give the stimulus. If it is left side, if the stimulus is coming from the left ear, we call left ipsy if it is recorded on the left side and right contra, uh, contralateral if it is recorded on the right side. So uh, the side is determined by the where you give the stimulus, sound stimulus. Uh, so once you give the sound stimulus that is uh, 85 dB above the threshold of hearing, it elicits both ipsilateral and contralateral acoustic reflex. And this can be measured by change in the compliance of the tympanic membrane on the, both the sides. 
what happens if there is mild to moderate sensory neural hearing loss since the acoustic reflex is elicited at a high sound intensity that is 85 db above the threshold of hearing normally mild to moderate degree of sensory neural hearing loss usually doesn't alter the acoustic reflex so you get normal acoustic reflex both in uh, ipsilateral as well as the contralateral side that is where you take the measurement as, as well as where you give the activator that is where that is you give the stimulus so in mild to moderate sensory neural hearing loss both ipsi and contralateral acoustic reflex are normal for the simple reason that acoustic reflex is elicited at very high intensity sound 85 db over the threshold of hearing so mild to moderate sensory neural hearing loss usually doesn't affect the uh, acoustic reflex what happens if there is a sensory neural hearing loss more than 50 db or a severe degree of sensory neural hearing loss then what happens is that uh, you need a very very high si sound stimulus in order to elicit the acoustic reflex as a result what happens is that uh, the acoustic reflex uh, you have to give uh, it is raised we call we, we give it a raised uh, intensity of sound basically so uh, if uh, the stimulus is on the right side and then you are measuring on the right side the uh, uh, the acoustic reflex is raised whereas on the other side once the sound stimulus goes in it is able to pick up however in the conductive hearing loss what happens is that sound is not able to reach the cochlea so if the sound is not able to reach the cochlea it is very unlikely that it is going to elicit any acoustic reflex so even mild degree of conductive hearing loss usually doesn't result in any acoustic reflex the other thing about conductive hearing loss is because the conductive hearing loss changes the compliance of the tympanic membrane and acoustic reflex is also basically measurement of the change in the compliance of the tympanic membrane it is difficult to measure the change in the compliance of the tympanic membrane that is why uh, in conductive hearing loss uh, there are two reasons one is the sound itself is not reaching the cochlea even at mild degree so it is very uh, difficult to elicit the um, acoustic reflex secondly uh, acoustic reflex is nothing but change in the compliance but in conductive hearing loss there is usually already change in the compliance of the tympanic membrane whether it's otosclerosis or there is a, a dimeric tympanic membrane uh, or there is negative pressure the compliance is already changed so to change uh, to measure the change in compliance where the compliance is already changed is already difficult that is why we say that uh, uh, acoustic reflex uh, is easily absent uh, what about the neurological lesions if there is lesion in the earth nerve what happens is that uh, the impulse is not able to come back to the for example there is lesion in the lesion uh, there is lesion in right uh, earth nerve so in the right it will always be absent because uh, whether you whether it's uh, you are giving ipsi or contralateral whether stimulus comes from right ear or the left ear the final contraction of the stipitus is by the seventh nerve so if there is lesion in the seventh nerve on the right side the right acoustic uh, acoustic reflex will always be absent however if the lesion is in the eighth nerve on the right side what happens that the if the, you give stimulus on the right side impulse cannot go in so if it cannot go go in then reflex will be absent both in right and left side however if the stimulus is coming from the left side and there's lesion in the right earth nerve the contra response will still be there because the right seventh nerve is intact so contra will be present however if the lesion is at the interaxial region that is at the level of the brain stem 
where there is crossing over to the opposite superior olivary complex, the crossover fibers occurs there. So if the lesions at the brain stem where the crossing over of the fibers occurs at the superior olivary complex, then what happens is that the uh, contralateral uh, reflex will be absent. But if she lateral, the whole circuit is still present. So if she lateral reflex are intact, whereas the contralateral uh, reflexes are uh, affected in case of the brainstem lesions. Now, um, what happens if there is an acoustic neuroma or retrocochlear pathology? In retrocochlear pathology, what happens there? Uh, there is usually a phenomenon called uh, recruitment. Thus, when there is recruitment, the uh, after a certain degree of sound, your 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 ear becomes oversensitive. Let's put it that way. As a result, the uh, the acoustic reflex may be present at a decreased level. But since there is a pathology of the eighth nerve, it can even be raised. So, or if it is really compressing on the nerve so much so, it can be absent because the impulse is not going at all. As a result, what will happen is that if there is a right acoustic neuroma, the if the lateral as well as the contralateral acoustic reflex can be either be raised, it can be absent, or it can be decreased. So it can happen anything in the retrocochlear pathology. However, if you are giving, if the acoustic neuroma is on the right side, but you are giving impulse, uh, the stimulus on the left side, then you will have normal, uh, if the left side there is no acoustic neuroma, it will have a normal response that side, ipsy. And also it can have a normal contralateral response. Or if the, the uh, tumor is big enough to compress the facial nerve, then obviously if the facial nerve is also involved on the opposite side, then even the contra will be affected. Thus, uh, um, uh, the tumors like acoustic neuroma will have a variable presentation. There may be a, a normal reflex, there may be a raised reflex, or there may be a total absent reflex or a decreased reflex can all occur. So, other important aspect about the acoustic neuroma is reflex decay. Normally what we do is we give the uh, stimulus the high intensity sound 85 dB above the threshold of hearing to elicit the acoustic reflex for a short duration of time, say one to two millisecond, and the uh, and the reflex is elicited. However, in order to measure the reflex decay, what you do is you give the stimulus for a longer duration. That is, you give the stimulus of sound for 10 milliseconds. So when you give the sound stimulus for 10 milliseconds, what will happen is that you measure the stapedal reflex at the beginning uh, when the uh, reflex is initiated. And then at the end of the 10 seconds, you can again measure the, what is the, uh, the reflex, acoustic reflex um, uh, amplitude. So, if there is decay by more than 50%, then we say that there is a retrocochlear pathology. Normally, nerve doesn't become fatigued that easily within 10 milliseconds. So, uh, from the starting of the acoustic reflex to the end of the 10 uh, millisecond, normally what is what happens is that you are able to maintain that acoustic reflex. However, in case of the retrocochlear pathology, as in acoustic neuroma, what happens is that there is a reflex decay and the amplitude becomes less than 50% 
of the original amplitude of the acoustic reflex. So the nerve tends to get fatigue easily, let's put it that way. So, uh, and it is not able to sustain the contraction. So the amplitude reduces. So this is one way uh, to differentiate the acoustic neuroma uh, by indirect means. Of course, uh, for acoustic neuroma, we have uh, MRI to diagnose and also uh, there is AVR uh, we can do, but this is an uh, indirect uh, way of uh, assessing and then uh, in you know, uh, screening as it can be used as a screening tool. And then uh, you can proceed with MRI if there are difficulties. So why do we have acoustic reflex in the first place? So if you see, you know, uh, you have to normally when you do this um, acoustic reflex you are using 226 hertz probe so that is the frequency of sound you you use however if you change the frequency to 1000 hertz what happens is that when the frequency increases rather than make it, making it you know more stiffened tympanic membrane the compliance actually increases so rather than making the tympanic membrane stiff and not allowing the sound to admit inside, it becomes the compliant, it becomes more compliant. As a result, more sound is admitted at 1000. So how is it going to protect, uh, the, how is the acoustic reflex going to protect from the loud sound? So it's not going to protect at 1000. So although it was initially thought that uh, the acoustic reflex is for protection from the loud sound, it will already take a few milliseconds for the sound to go elicit the reflex, then only the reflex will occur. So it is not going to uh, protect you from the uh, gunshot injury or sudden blast. However, if there is a sustained sound for a long period of time, high intensity, probably you can be protected from that. But more important than that is, uh, from the evolutionary point of view, why this reflex had to be present? Because this gunshot bomb, industry noise came later in life. When the life started, this was not there. It was all, these are all man-made noise. So but from the evolutionary point of view, this acoustic reflex was, you know, when 